Thank you so much, Ollie, uh, and thank you very much to uh, ONT for the invitation to speak to you today, and for everyone for turning up. So, um, can I have a quick show of hands? Who uh, uh, listened to and enjoyed Nick Lohman's talk downstairs? Okay, so most people. So that's great. Um, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So I better. Um, so yes, uh, you've heard you've heard some of what we've done from Nick uh, already. Um, what I'm going to do is focus much more on the uh, epidemiology and biology of what we've done rather than the genomics. And so, as Nick said, we have a, uh, a project called Zebra where we've been sequencing uh, uh, Zika uh, virus in Brazil. So just to give a bit of background, I'm uh, an evolutionary biologist by training, and I spent most of my career uh, focusing solely on what on trying to extract new kinds of biological information from genome sequences. So that's involved developing a lot of theory uh, and, and computer programs. Uh, and the really exciting thing for me is, in the past, in order for me to do an, uh, some real science, I would have to collaborate with another genomics team, often at a large institute like the Sanger Institute, who were generating the data that we could then apply our new methods to. Um, uh, technologies like the Minion means that we no longer need to do that. We're able to do it ourselves in our own group uh, and, and, uh, and span all the way from, from uh, samples coming out of a patient to uh, the computer analysis which tells us about um, uh, global epidemics at the other end. So, I'm going to uh, uh, begin by introducing uh, some of the biology of Zika virus to you. I don't know how much uh, you know about it. So you've obviously heard about it in the news. Zika is a flavivirus, so that's a mosquito-transmitted um, uh, virus, and its genome is about 11 KB long, single-stranded RNA um, genome, and it's mainly transmitted by AED species mosquitoes. There is some sexual transmission of, of Zika. We don't think that contributes greatly to, to the overall force of infection. And this was, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're a, a virus nerd like me, you know there are hundreds and thousands of really obscure viruses out there in the literature and in the database that, uh, that have been discovered and virtually never looked at since. Uh, coronaviruses were one example of that before SARS, and Zika was another example of this before 2007. So before 2007, Zika was only thought to cause a mild fever, and there were only 16 recorded cases. That started to change. Uh, between 2007 and 2015, there were an increasing number of cases reported in, in Southeast Asia and epidemics in Pacific Islands. We're going to start by uh, thinking about April 2015, which is when there was the first detection of Zika transmission in the Americas. And shortly after that, in summer 2015, there was a large Zika epidemic in, uh, in Brazil, which you can see there uh, as the blue line. Six months later, there was a really worrying rise in recorded uh, severe microcephaly in newborn babies in Brazil, and that was the, the red line. And as a result of that, the potential link between birth defects and Zika, the World Health Organization declared it to be a public health emergency of international concern. So that's Feb 2016. So, I mean, the, the obvious question is, what on earth can virus, can genomics do to help um, these Brazilian mums and their beautiful babies, but you know these babies are going to require lifelong care and have very severe learning difficulties. Now, I think there's three main ways that, that genomes can help. The first is just to characterize the genetic diversity of the virus, which is absolutely essential for devising uh, uh, vaccines in response to the epidemic. Secondly, we want to be able to know if there's any virus mutations that are directly associated with more severe disease. So if we get virus genomes from, uh, from mothers or babies uh, with birth defects or microcephaly, are there virus mutations that are associated with those cases but not with the majority of asymptomatic cases? Uh, so far, the answer seems to be no. There's no clear uh, viral genetic determinant of virulence. 
thirdly, we can use the virus genomes to track the spread of Zika amongst different locations, understand how it got into the Americas, how it spread amongst different locations, and that can help us predict where it goes next. Now, that's particularly important for understanding the microcephaly problem. If we want to know what fraction of, uh, uh, of babies with birth defects had, uh, had um, that illness as a result of Zika infection, we need to know in each region when Zika first got there and could potentially start to cause that disease. And it turns out that across the Americas, uh, different regions first got Zika at different times. So we need to understand the pre-Zika baseline level of microcephaly. And the only way we can do that is to know when Zika first got into each region. And the only way we can answer that question is through doing some fancy uh, evolutionary analysis of virus genomes. So uh, in early 2016, when there was the public health emergency of international concern, uh, we published one paper uh, with some early results, and there were 10 Zika virus genomes from Brazil. And around that time, the projected number of infections across Brazil was 37 million. So that's not a great sampling ratio. Uh, so why were there so few? Uh, Nick has already addressed that question. It turns out to be quite hard to se sequence Zika directly from clinical material without sampling the virus, uh, without culturing the virus. So um, we aimed to resolve that problem through the Zebra Project, which uh, Nick has uh, helpfully introduced because I'm running way behind schedule. So here's the here's the bus, and uh, the bus travelled through the northeast Brazil. These locations in red. Uh, here's some photos, uh, Nuno from my lab doing some sequencing, some sampling of mosquitoes, Luis Shalakantara, uh, and Nick watching Game of Thrones. Okay, uh, as Nick mentioned, the problem is we've got really low virus copy number in clinical samples, and, and, and Nick and Josh got the solution to that through uh, algorithmic primer design, primal scheme, multiplex tiling PCR, minion Illumina sequencing, and then their assembly and QC pipeline, nature protocols in press, and it's also on bioarchive. Okay, you've seen this slide already from Nick. So uh, on the left, we've got the genome coverage versus the t CT value. So we've got decent genome coverage for CTs below about 30, 32, but then really variable coverage uh, above that, and there's parts of the genome that we just see, don't seem to be able to sequence at all. But as a, as a molecular epidemiologist, this is fine. You don't, you know, I'm not trying to get a perfect genome for every strain. So long as I've got enough variation across this set of genomes, uh, we can do some accurate phylogenetic analysis. And we've actually done a, a huge raft of simulations to work out where the threshold is. And if you get sort of 60% of the genome, you're getting pretty accurate phylogenetic results. So this is a bit, this is a bit where I get really excited. Uh, this is the phylogeny, and this is basically describing uh, our current state of knowledge of the Zika virus epidemic in the Americas. So if you look at the top left, um, what we've got is some outbreaks in, in uh, French Polynesia in 2013. Uh, and we know that the virus came into the Americas from, from the Pacific. Now, the, the, the line I really want you to look at is this dotted line here, which is um, April, May 2015. That is the point at which Zika was first detected in the Americas. So everything that happened before that was cryptic, hidden transmission in the Americas. And it's clear that the virus, because these are colored by different parts of the Americas, is already across multiple different locations in the Americas before we even knew it was there. So we can see our, our estimate of where it first came into the Americas is this, is this blue location, that's northeast Brazil, which corroborate, which kind of matches all the anecdotal evidence we've got about early cases as well. Um, and then there's been exports from northeast Brazil uh, to the high-density regions in southeast Brazil, so that's Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, uh, and then also separate exports to the Caribbean. Um, we're, we're working actively now on characterizing the Central American um, lineage with some uh, further sequencing. And uh, South America, this is 
elsewhere in South America except for Brazil, and that's mostly places like Colombia and Venezuela. So reading some important information from that phylogeny, what we've got is uh, the timings, and that's what these box and whisker plots are, of the earliest export of, of Zika out of northeast Brazil to other parts of the Americas. And these little arrows here are the first recorded case of Zika in those regions. So we can see in each region there was an entire season or half a season of Zika virus transmission before it was discovered. And, and, and this, is the, this is the recorded case data. So there was another epidemic here in, in South America the year before that nobody even detected. And that's crucial for understanding the patterns of microcephaly through space and time. And uh, lastly, as... Uh, as Nick mentioned, um, the lab was in, in uh, Mene Girard last week sequencing yellow fever. They have generated 20 genomes so far, so they've kind of doubled the amount of genomic information for yellow fever virus in, in, in Brazil within a week, and they're still doing another 20 samples now. There's some preliminary data on virological.org. Um, very, very briefly, we've got uh, endemic circulation in primates, um, uh, which is called the sylvatic cycle of transmission here. And here we can see the spillover of that transmission uh, towards the human, to human cases, which are in red. Um, so lots more work to do there. That was, that was uh, uh, hot off the press this morning. Thanks a lot. Uh, can we take any questions for Oliver? Yes, please, at the front. Uh, you can just wait for the microphone to come around. So that'd be great. So that's Thanks. acknowledgements. As you can see, it's a rather large <laughs> consortium project. <laughs> Oliver, uh, William Valdivia from Orion Biosciences. Uh, one of the issues in South America is the reporting of co-infections. Yeah. And, you know, co-infections of Zika, Dengue, and Chikungunya at the same time. Given the, the platform that you're working on, have you tried to look or design uh, a, you know, an approach or a, a experimental protocol that will allow you to pick up the co-infections on the samples? That's definitely the next stage. So um, Anik is going out in a few weeks back for Zebra 2, and we're very much hoping to capture the broader range of arboviral diversity. You know, because case reports are just based on symptoms, and we don't know if this is chikungunya, we don't know if this is, is Zika. And, you know, I don't think we're going to have huge amounts of Zika incidents in two years' time, but we will still have lots of dengue, and we will still have lots of chikungunya. So I think, yeah, we need a broad arboviral surveillance platform. Bob Majaro is also coming up. AMIRO, yeah, or a push. Yeah. Any more questions at all? One at the front here. Are people starting to think about uh, trying to enhance surveillance actually in the uh, original, in the vector organisms? So you're know, thinking whether you're talking about Ebola, Zika, whatever else, and you say, well, there's a whole season of epidemic before you even spot it's there. But we're starting from when you see it in people. You know, does the Min Island you know, give you the opportunity now to actually start trying to anticipate in advance of seeing it in people you know, what you might be you know, looking out for next? Yeah, I mean, obviously, for... Uh, for for mosquito-borne diseases, we have the ability to do that if we if we sample mosquitoes. Um, we we did sample mosquitoes in zebra, but um, we didn't generate any virus genomes from them. Some of those yellow fever virus genomes are from mosquitoes. Um, uh, what's so? Yes, I think that's that's worth doing for other. In, for other emerging infectious diseases, say like Ebola, we're not entirely clear what the reservoir is. So. I, I think really early detection and response in human population, the best, the best surveillance system is, is, is for, for an emerging infection is humans. It started to spread among... We're never going to predict in advance which viruses are going to leap the species barrier and start spreading. But if we can find the very earliest cases within the first few weeks, we can shut down transmission immediately. We might not have Ebola outbreak ever again if we can detect the first handful of cases and shut down transmission. Um, I think that is what we should be aiming for. Okay, great. I think we'll save it for there. If there's any more questions, please save them for the end when we have the panel discussion. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.